Hello and welcome to another edition of the Lab Report. I'm your host Paul Krampitz and today we're going to talk about ICP, inductively coupled plasma spectroscopy, and how you get, gather and use data. We're going to be talking about something called universal data acquisition. So in order to appreciate that a little bit more, I'll give you a little history first. Way back when, a uh, long time ago for me, uh, we used to use uh, photomultiplier tubes, one for every wavelength that we wanted to use. They were typically mounted in a Posh and Runge mount spectrometer that would hold up to about 32 tubes at once. So if you wanted to do more than that or you wanted to do different wavelengths, you really couldn't. So you were very limited in the information that you gathered. Nowadays, the solid state detectors that we use on the Optima uh, gather all kinds of information all at once. The only problem is until UDA or universal data acquisition, you still only use the fraction of the data. Let me tell you a story that might help bring this a little bit more into perspective. Yesterday I went to the grocery store and I got some bananas for my kids. I know you're trying to figure out what this has to do with UDA, but hold on with me here and we'll find out. So I went to the shop for some bananas. I came back home. What did my kids really want? They wanted apples, oranges, grapes, and pears. So I had to go back to the grocery store. Same kind of thing with UDA. I know I'm making a joke here, or trying to, but with UDA, if you went and you wanted to look for zinc and you picked the wrong wavelength, you're gathering all the information at once. It's still there. You still have zinc. You have zinc 213.856 and 206.200 and 334. You have the whole bunch of zinc wavelengths that are there for you. All you have to do is put them into your method and reprocess them. And, and likewise, if a customer asks for a different element that you didn't think you ran for initially, you still have everything saved. You just have to go back and say, okay, instead of zinc, I want you to reprocess copper, nickel, iron, uh, whatever, whatever else uh, that you want to do that you didn't think you did. So the main point here is that universal data acquisition gathers all the data, all the spectra, everything that you need to do all kinds of different things that will save you time in the laboratory. And what are those things? One is data validation. How many times have you ran a certain wavelength and found that it doesn't work? And then you have to go back and rerun. Now all you have to do, like this example here, that you can see with cobalt. Let's say you ran a solution, your cobalt number is too low, you see a negative number here, and your zinc number is too high. So what do you do? You put the other wavelengths into your method, and then you simply reprocess the data. As you can see here, you have the correct number for cobalt using a different wavelength, and you have a better number for tin using a different wavelength for it. You didn't have to rerun anything. All you had to do was just reprocess your data. So data validation, that type of thing is, is uh, very important. And the silly joke we made about the fruit um, is still valid with UDA. If a customer asks for an element you don't think that you ran initially, you have it. You have the whole grocery store. So just go back to your method, put in the other elements that you want, and reprocess the data. And even better, you might be asking yourself, or saying, now wait a minute, how can you process something that you didn't run initially, you don't have a standard? Well, we sell a kit called a UDA kit, that when you mix these together, one to 10, you have a one PPM solution of the whole periodic table. So you run this along with your samples as a sample, and you can reprocess it later as a calibration standard. So if someone is asking for an element that you didn't initially report, you have a way to quantitate that element because you ran a standard for it. You simply go back, add it as a calibration standard after you add the element, reprocess your data, and now you have the element that the customer asked for that you didn't think you ran initially without having to rerun. So you did in 30 seconds what you normally did in 30 minutes. So you're saving yourself a lot of time. Uh, finally, in the third point, is for those of you that are doing environmental applications or running drinking waters or wastes or sludges or digestates, you know that you probably are going to have a lot of interferences in your solution and that the wavelengths you use for your analyte and the wavelengths that you use for your standards might not be the right one. 
So you gather all that information, you make your inner element correction tables, and you find they don't work. So here's another example, a final example, where you can see that the numbers aren't quite right. For iron, let's say, it's supposed to be 200 ppm and we're reading outside of EPA specification. So it's not valid. However, you can see here, if we use a different wavelength for iron and reprocess, that one runs much more linear and gives you a better number that's well within the EPA specification. You simply use that wavelength, regenerate an IEC table very quickly, reprocess your data, and you, don't, you have corrected numbers the right way within spec without having to rerun anything. So, what did we learn today? Well, we learned <laughs> some silly jokes with fruit and how they apply to universal data acquisition and ICP emission spectrometry, right? We talked about if you use UDA, it does a really good job of data validation. It does a good job if you're having to report an element that you don't think you ran the first time, report it quantitatively. And thirdly, if you're doing uh, interference corrections and they weren't right the first time, you can reprocess with the other information you have and get corrected data very, very quickly and save yourself an awful lot of time. So hopefully you learned something today, you'll be smarter tomorrow. This was another edition of Lab Report and hopefully we'll see you next week.